Okay, so let's begin the final section of this program related to special tests in the QME exam. And we've now handled the physical examination findings for the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine, both in the event of either radiculopathy and or myelopathy. And uh, we're now going to move into special tests in the radiographic examination of the QME exam. And just as a way of introduction, doctors, I don't know how many of you order diagnostic studies uh, in conjunction with your physical examination findings, but for many of the permanent impairments described in the AMA guides, uh, diagnostic studies are required, uh, are required for the determination of permanent impairment. And uh, we're going to talk about some of those diagnostic studies here, at least relate, as relates to the spine. Now, when I first uh, started producing this particular program, I had high hopes of being able to handle uh, all the special tests uh, for the spine, for the upper extremity, and the lower extremity, all in this one program. And as I got into this program, I found that that was a little overly ambitious, and I had to uh, reduce the focus of the program simply to the spine. And I will get into special tests in the upper and lower extremity exams in another program, uh, which I'll produce probably shortly after this one is done. But uh, in this section of the program, uh, I do describe some of the diagnostic studies that are required uh, in the upper extremities and the lower extremities. And I mention that here to stimulate your interest uh, for the next program on the upper and lower extremities. So what you're about to hear now, uh, we're going to get into these diagnostic studies. And we're going to focus on two things here related to the spine. We're going to focus on uh, the analysis of motion segment integrity. And then if time permits, we're going to get into uh, a discussion of compression fractures and how to use the diagnostic studies to determine permanent impairment due to compression fractures. So I'm going to begin by uh, introducing an excerpt uh, of another program that I produced previously. And it's entitled, The 21 Secrets of the Most Persuasive QMEs. And I, I alluded to this program earlier in the introduction to this program. And in that program, The 21 Secrets uh, of the Most Persuasive QMEs, I, I go over several examination secrets that are used by some of the very best uh, qualified medical evaluators in the whole state of California that I had the opportunity uh, to interview. And specifically, uh, in that program, I talk about secrets, uh, examination secrets, uh, number seven, number eight, and number nine, uh, as, uh, as, the, as I described them in that program. I ordered them number seven, eight, and nine. And those are secrets that are related to how doctors use diagnostic studies uh, in coming up with their conclusions. So I'm going to insert here into this program an excerpt uh, from the 21 Secrets program that first talks about uh, the necessity of ordering appropriate diagnostic studies, not only for the spine, but also for the upper and lower extremities. And then after that, uh, we're going to get into a, a fairly detailed analysis of how to perform uh, an analysis of motion segment integrity. And uh, I'll be interjecting uh, comments uh, as they are appropriate uh, at certain sections of the discussion that's going to follow. OK, so stay tuned. What you're going to hear now is excerpted from the program 21 Secrets. And then after this brief discussion on the uh, necessity of diagnostic studies, I'll come back and I'll introduce the topic of uh, performing an analysis of motion segment integrity. Interview and physical examination secret number seven is order appropriate diagnostic studies. And these physical examination secrets, actually the next three physical examination secrets, all have to do with uh, diagnostic studies. Uh, secret number seven is order appropriate diagnostic studies. 
Secret number eight is to enlist the radiologist. Secret number eight is to analyze for loss of motion segment integrity. And we're going to spend this some time on this section, uh, especially with regards to an analysis of motion segment integrity. And I'm going to go through a uh, step-by-step procedure for performing the analysis of motion segment integrity and also for uh, recording your findings. Uh, let's begin with secret number seven, which is order appropriate diagnostic studies. So the question is, uh, what studies, what diagnostic studies are required by the AMA guides? And let me just ask you, what studies, what studies have you heard referred to or have you seen mention of uh, in the AMA guides? Well, let me give you some references uh, from some of the specific chapters. In chapter 15, the spine chapter, it discusses uh, some of the following diagnostic studies. It talks about plain film x-ray studies, talks about CT studies, talk, talks about MRI studies both with and without contrast, talks about electromyography or EMG testing, also talks about systometry testing uh, for assessing the bladder. What about chapter 16? Chapter 16, uh, the upper extremity chapter, talks about some of the following uh, studies. Talks about x-ray studies. Talks about EMG and CV studies. That's nerve conduction velocity testing studies. Talks about MRI studies. Talks about bone scan. Talks about laser Doppler studies for uh, assessing vascular integrity talks about arthrogram studies. So quite a few diagnostic studies described in the AMA guides. What about chapter 17, the lower extremities? Chapter 17 uh, makes specific reference to x-ray studies, uh, refers to EMG NCV studies, talks about Doppler studies for assessing vascular integrity, talks about MRI and CT scans, and also talks about uh, bone scan studies. So let's talk uh, about some of the uses of x-ray uh, and let's limit our focus for now uh, to x-ray. Um, of course, the topic of diagnostic studies itself uh, is a huge topic, specifically, specifically if we were to consider all the various modalities of diagnostic studies that we just uh, discussed. But let's just talk about uh, some of the uses of x-ray uh, in the evaluation of permanent impairment as those uh, x-ray studies are described. Uh, in the AMA guides. And remember, the, the overriding philosophy of this particular uh, physical examination secret is to order the appropriate diagnostic studies. And the guides uh, require uh, plain film x-rays in the determination of several uh, different types of permanent impairments. So let's go over just a few of those now so you will be uh, refamiliarize with the importance at least of uh, plain film x-rays uh, in the evaluation of permanent impairment. Um, in chapter 15, the spine chapter, x-rays uh, are used for several different things. Uh, number one, they're used to help identify pre-existing conditions uh, or uh, spinal anomalies, for example. Uh, they're used for the assessment of the acute or late effect of fractures. They're used for an analysis or for a determination of the loss of motion segment integrity. And we'll go over uh, um, a practical method to per perform an analysis uh, of motion segment integrity here in, in this program in just a few moments. In chapter 16, the upper extremity chapter, 
Uh, X-rays are used for uh, a determination of permanent impairment due to ankylosis. Uh, X-rays are used to determine trophic changes of bone. And you can find specific reference to that on pages 495 and 496. Um, X-rays are used for an evaluation of carpal instability. That would be permanent impairment due to other disorders described in chapter 16. So let me ask you, have you ordered X-ray studies for the evaluation of carpal instability? The AMA guides uh, specifically describe uh, a method for determining the presence or absence of carpal instability on x-ray and it requires specific views and uh, the purpose of this chapter is to uh, of this particular secret is to encourage you to become familiar uh, with the specific x-rays required for an analysis of carpal instability and uh, those are listed in chapter 16 uh, with regards to the lower extremity uh, impairments in chapter 17, x-rays are used for uh, measurements related to arthritis. For arthritis, we use x-rays to measure the cartilage interval, or, or more specifically, we measure for loss of the cartilage interval. And that requires specific x-ray views to be taken on each of the lower extremity articulations. Uh, we also use x-ray for an evaluation of limb length discrepancy. We use x-rays to confirm impairments due to gait disturbance. And this is an interesting point because some of the gait disturbance impairments described in chapter 17 require uh, an objective finding uh, that can only be found on the x-ray. Um, chapter 17 uh, describes the use of x-rays for determination of joint ankylosis, uh, requires the use of x-ray for description or determination of fractures, and even for permanent impairments uh, related to neurologic conditions such as causalgia, in chronic regional pain syndrome. Those are some of the uh, descriptions in chapters 15, 16, and 17 that describe um, the use of spe uh, the specific use of x-rays. Uh, other um, imaging and electrodiagnostic testing modalities are described in each of the chapters. And in addition to those specific references in the guides, I'm sure you can imagine that diagnostic studies uh, would have other uses as well. Uh, specifically, you may rely on diagnostic study findings uh, to support your conclusions related to uh, causation, industrial causation for um, for the injury in the first place. Or perhaps you might rely on uh, your findings on diagnostic studies to help support your conclusions on apportionment. In fact, that was uh, the whole basis of the Escobedo case uh, was diagnostic study findings of advanced degenerative change uh, of the knee that, that supported the conclusion for apportionment of permanent impairment of the compensable consequence Right, injury, uh, right knee injury following a specific injury to the left knee. So that's a classic example, a famous example, of how, how diagnostic studies uh, were critical in the uh, apportionment determination. So the point of this uh, discussion is to make sure to order the appropriate diagnostic studies. And when you order those diagnostic studies, make sure that they're done uh, perfectly every time. Make sure that the views of x-rays that you're getting or the type of MRI that you're ordering is exactly what it is, exactly what is required for the determination that you're after. 
For example, as I mentioned earlier, the analysis of carpal instability uh, requires very specific x-ray views of the wrist to be obtained. And those are described in the, in the guides. Well, many times uh, imaging facilities are not familiar uh, with these specific views. Uh, imaging facilities many times uh, these technicians of course they're not familiar with the AMA guides so they rely on you to produce the images that you need and so your instruction to them needs to be very specific and you need to communicate with them prior uh, to the injured worker showing up for the uh, studies so that the technician is on the same page with you and the technician is producing images that are uh, appropriate and remember that uh, in the end you doctor you are the one that's responsible for making sure that the diagnostic studies that you are given uh, number one are uh, of sufficient diagnostic quality to be considered diagnostic and number two that they contain the views that you rely upon or that the AMA guides require that you rely upon in the formulation of your conclusions. So secret number seven is to order, diag order the appropriate diagnostic studies for every case and never render any conclusions without uh, supportive diagnostic studies or without diagnostic studies upon which you can rely in support of your conclusions.